I think we should go ahead and begin. Can you hear me, yeah. this microphone? Uh, my name is Paul Beck, and I'm the chair of the steering committee for the Emeritus Academy. And I want to welcome you to the sixth in our series of 2017-2018 Emeritus Academy lectures. Uh, we have two more coming up, one in, in April. Uh, it will be Mary Jo Fresh, who will be talking about the importance of study abroad uh, and the impact of study abroad. Uh, I also want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences Digital Media Studio. This is their representative right over here. Uh, they will be videotaping this lecture. They videotaped every lecture so far this year uh, in this series. Uh, and we post those on the website of the Emeritus Academy. And so if you missed a lecture or you want to go back and see a particular part that you were interested in, you will find it on, on the website itself. I also want to remind Emeritus Academy members that we will have another round of small grants. Uh, and the deadline for those is May the 1st. Uh, so get your application in. There is detailed information about the small grants competition on the website. And I urge you to take a look at it there. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Charles Klopp. Uh, he's a professor emeritus of Italian uh, from the Department of French and Italian. Uh, he tells me that he started at Ohio State in 1976. I, of course, at the time was a mere child. No, I, I wish I could say that, but I, I can't. <laughs> but I wasn't here at the time. He has published, in, over the course of his academic career, eight books and 170 articles and reviews, many of which have been published since he retired. So he's remained very active uh, as a scholar. Uh, and they focus mainly on Italian, well, I think wholly maybe, on Italian literature and culture covering the medieval to modern times. So quite a broad swath of coverage in terms of his attention. Uh, as I read through the material that was describing his work, I located a number of topics that were very interesting to me. Uh, one of them is that he's done work on Italian prisoners which as a political scientist I thought was kind of an interesting thing, on Pinocchio and Frankenstein, and I'd love to hear more about that uh, and the comparison between the two of them, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and then on identity in Trieste, which he's going to talk about today. And having been to Trieste, I was really interested in, in that as well. Uh, today he's going to talk to us about poets' use of language and dialects in Italy, and I'm really pleased to turn to him. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to see if I can do this, right? I'm a little bit more comfortable. Can you all hear me in the back? Huh? Everyone? There's a microphone as well. Thank you very much for coming. I'm glad to see uh, colleagues, fellow members of the academy, students, and uh, my grandson uh, as well. Over the past 50 and more years, I have taught Italian at all levels, from elementary language courses to graduate seminars. Frequently, when I taught Italian 101, students would come up after class and tell me that they had been trying out what they had been learning with a relative who had grown up in Italy. A grandmother, usually. Almost always a grandmother. How did that go? I would ask. Well, they would say, she could understand what I said, but I couldn't understand her at all. Maybe, I would answer, that's because she spoke a dialect. What's a dialect? It's a local language spoken perhaps in just one village or one region. What you have been learning here is not a dialect, but Italian, the national language that is used in schools, on television, in the newspapers, and so on. Oh, they would say. I understand. But then they would look at me a little strangely. What they were seeing, or so I thought, was a university professor of Italian, all right, but one whose name was Charles Klopp, and who was certainly not Italian, and maybe not even Catholic. <laughs> no matter what I knew about Italy and the Italian language, I could sense they were thinking, was what I was teaching them the real Italian? Or was the language their grandmother spoke? Their grandmother, whose Italian cooking was wonderful, who knew lots of proverbs and maybe the various saints' days. Maybe her language was somehow more authentic, more the real deal, while what they were studying in class was not. What I would like to do this afternoon is explore this difference between my hypothetical student's grandmother's Italian on the one hand and the language we teach at Ohio State on the other. 
I'm going to discuss from a sociological rather than a linguistic point of view what the difference is between the hundreds of dialects spoken, or maybe that used to be spoken, all over Italy and the national language. I will also say something about why poets have turned more and more in recent years to writing poetry in dialect in a national context where by now everyone speaks Italian and the dialects as a spoken medium of communication are falling into disuse. I will do this with reference to Trieste, a city with an unusual history where the Triestino dialect has played perhaps a more important role in metropolitan life than dialects anywhere else in Italy. But first some slides of the city to give a sense of what Trieste looks like. <clears throat> this is the central square of the city, uh, the Piazza dell'Unità, the Square of Unity. It faces the northern end of the Adriatic Sea and then Venice on the other side of the water. At the center of the slide is the city hall to the left and right buildings that once housed the shipping and insurance companies that were so important in the commercial life of the city. These would be the days when the Lloyd Triestino Company had 14 shipping lines that kept 61 vessels busy sailing as far away as India and China, while another company had 34 ships following similar routes. During these years, Trieste was the seventh most productive port in the world. Uh, this is the Molo Audace, the Audace Pier, and the Stock Exchange, the Borsa. The principal pier of the city, the Molo Audace, is the principal pier, pier of the city where the Italian destroyer named Laudace uh, landed in 1918 to a tumultuous welcome that signaled the political union of the city with Italy and gave this pier its present name. Also in the slide is the building that once housed the Stock Exchange where fortunes were made and lost during the economic heyday of the city, as described, for example, in Italo Svevo's well-known novel, The Consciousness of Zeno. Note the neoclassical architecture of this 1755 building in the center of Trieste. The presence of this imposing building for financial transactions reminds us that some fishing and salt farming apart, for most of its history, Trieste has been, above all, a commercial city with virtually no agriculture or industry, and no landed aristocracy either. Just as depicted in Svevo's novels, the, the metropolitan society of this seaport was predominantly middle class, cosmopolitan, and frequently rich. The Canal Grande, the Grand Canal, uh, is in these slides, and it brought ships straight into the heart of the city to offload cargo where other ships loaded and unloaded while anchored at the quays extending on either side of the Piazza Unita. The Church of St. Anthony the Healer, uh, at the slide to the right, is a Catholic church. Near it, there is a Serbian church, San Spiridione, of about the same size and architectural importance. You can see a bit of this church in the upper right corner of the slide. The buildings that flanked the Canal Grande were once warehouses with offices and sometimes residences above them. Beyond Sant'Antonio Tamaturgo, you can see the high plateau of the Carso or Karst, going up there, or beginning up there, uh, uh, stretching out towards Slovenia and the Balkans beyond. As you can see from these slides, the architecture of Trieste comes mostly from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. There are hardly any buildings in the city from the medieval or renaissance periods, let alone earlier. Both in terms of its architecture and in terms of its history, Trieste is very different from other Italian cities, say Florence, with its many medieval and renaissance buildings, or Rome, which still bears the architectural trappings of what it was when it was an imperial city before the beginnings of the Christian era. Uh, Umberto, this is one of the three uh, life-size bronze statues in the city. The other two are of Svevo and of James Joyce, uh, who lived there and is kind of an honorary Triestino. Saba, who wrote almost entirely, in, almost entirely in Italian rather than Triestino, was a contemporary of the first two, that is of Svevo and Joyce, as well as of Virgilio Giotti, some of whose poems I will read to you in, to you in a moment. Both Svevo and Saba were Jewish, part of the very large Jewish population of the city. 
and both wrote under pseudonyms, Italo Svevo instead of Ettore Schmitz, and Umberto Saba instead of Umberto Poli. Giotti, too, wrote under a pseudonym, his birth name being Schoenbeck. Uh, Paul has been here, I've learned, just now. Uh, this is the castle of Miramare, which was built by the Archduke Maximilian of Austria in the mid-19th century. Maximilian loved the sea and was to die overseas after he was named Emperor of Mexico, caught up in the Mexican Revolution and executed by firing squad in 1867. During the Nazi occupation of Trieste, the castle served as the headquarters of the occupying German army and afterwards as the headquarters of the U.S. troops who drove out the Germans uh, and occupied the city in turn. Today it is a museum and a venue for classical music concerts. In this slide, too, you can see the karst uh, in the background, the hills in the background. Uh, I have a couple maps here uh, at the time of the Venetian Empire, and you could see the, the star is, uh, is Venice, but Trieste is over here. That is to say, not part of the Venetian Empire. And even earlier, if you go to this other map of Italy, which you can see is divided into many, many different little states and statelets, uh, and here again, the Venetian Empire stretches around here, and Trieste is up here as part of, uh, 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 of Austria. Uh, this is how uh, Trieste uh, looks today, uh, surrounded, as you see, again, here it's in red, surrounded by Slovenia, uh, Croatia, and, uh, and budding into Italy with uh, Austria, Hungary, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and Serbia uh, not far, not far, not far away. Here are some important dates. 1382. Trieste, worried about being overcome by, by Venice, placed itself under the protection of the Duke of Austria. 1719, maybe the most important date in the entire history of this city, Trieste was named a free port by the Austrian emperor. That means that goods that came into the city were not taxed and goods that went out of the city were not taxed either. So it was possible uh, to make a fortune under these circumstances with uh, Trieste, the principal uh, port, uh, the only port, really, of the Austrian Empire, the only warm water port of the Austrian, of the Austrian Empire. And so it, it, served to move, it served to move goods uh, from uh, the Middle East uh, and from the Orient up into, central, up into Central Europe. 1781, there was an edict of tolerance that extends religious liberty to non-Catholics anywhere in the Austrian Empire. And Jews uh, from all over uh, Europe uh, uh, rushed, uh, flocked to Trieste where many of them will make their fortunes. They came from Italy, uh, they came from Greece, uh, they came from uh, Central Europe. Uh, some spoke Sephardic, uh, some spoke uh, Yiddish, but they didn't really have a language in common. So they took to speaking, not Italian, but not German, but Triestino. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the Jews who came to, to, uh, to Trieste flourished. Many became rich. Some were given noble titles by the, uh, by the, emp by the emperor. One founded the, important, the most important newspaper uh, in the city, uh, and they were active uh, in, in civic life as well as commercial life. Uh, 1857, you see the opening of the railroad link between Trieste and Vienna carried the goods in the ways that I've just described. 1918, the end of World War I, the arrival of that uh, destroyer, and Italy now, Trieste now part for the first time, for the very first time of Italy. Part of Italy politically, not only culturally, but politically, not only sort of linguistically, uh, but uh, politically. Uh, six years later, fascism came to power and took over all of Italy, including Trieste. The war came to an end in 1943 on the 8th of September. Uh, and at that point, the Germans uh, occupied uh, the city of Trieste. These were terrible times. Uh, occupied the city of Trieste. 1945, they were occupied again. The Germans were driven out. They were occupied again, but this time by Marshal Tito's uh, army, uh, which had a lot of scores to settle. Th they were, again, very difficult times. The Americans came in in June, about 55 days later, it seems to me, uh, and it was the, the city was liberated or occupied by U.S. and British troops. Uh, and it was a bone of contention. It, it was hard. No one, no one could... There was, there was a lot of discussion about what should happen to Trieste and the surrounding territories. 
1945, finally, 1954, finally, the UN declared Trieste Italian, but Istria, uh, the area beyond the city, uh, down south toward in, into, the, into the Adriatic, uh, became Yugoslavian. Uh, Yugoslavia came to an end, and in 1992, uh, uh, Yugoslavia was divided into Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, and other countries. So you get this, uh, this is the situation you see on the previous uh, map. Uh, Istria is this heart-shaped, they say, uh, area here, once part of Venice, then part of Austria, then part of Italy, and now part of, uh, and now part of uh, Croatia. Uh, in this list of dates, you can see the big void between the late 14th century, let me go back to, no, no, between the late 14th century and the early 18th, right in here. Uh, this is the whole period of the Renaissance in Italy and elsewhere in Europe. After Trieste became a free port in 1719, the population grew tremendously, from around 3,000 people at the beginning of the century to more than 200,000 at the beginning of the First World War. Between 1890 and 1915, that is during the early years of Svevo, Sabas, and Giotti's life, it grew from 155,000 to 243,000, an increase of 40%. Beginning during these years, as I've said, the city was predominantly Italian in terms of culture. And I think we can say that with some exceptions, all of the writers and other intellectuals who provided the city with its identity wrote in Italian rather than German, Slovenian, or, so, or some other language. Politically, Trieste did not become part of, the, of Italy until 1918, and not definitively until 1954, after a very painful interregnum some of whose bitter effects can still be felt in the city and surrounding territory. Trieste has always been unique among Italian cities, a border city, and in many ways a city on the edge in several senses. Its culture was and is polyglot and multi-ethnic. But in the city, everyone, whatever their origins or religion, spoke Triestino, even when the, the official language, the language of bureaucracy and of the government, was the German of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This strong preference for Triestina was still the case today, when my colleague, Elvio Guanini, who spoke at Ohio State a few years ago, speaks in dialect, not just with cab drivers and waitresses, but also with his colleagues at the university, unless there is a foreigner like me present, at which time he will switch to Italian. The, the Chinese immigrants who own the clothing stores near the station and the West Africans who sell trinkets on the streets of the old city communicate with their customers in Triestino rather than Italian which they might not even know very well. And the people who write letters to the electronic versions of the local newspaper as often or not express their indignation or ironic disapproval of the facts reported in the paper in what is an often salty and irreverent Triestino. In Trieste then, Triestino is a language used by everyone, whatever their social class, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. This was true both during the years when the city was the most important part, port in the Austrian Empire and the median income was more than 50 kroner compared to the little over 9 kroner of Vienna. It is still true today when the economic prosperity that once provided such vitality to Trieste's largely bourgeois and highly secular culture has faded. While I'm not a linguist, uh, there's one here so I better say this, while I'm not a linguist uh, but a literary historian, let me say something about the dialect of Trieste. Syntactically and phonetically, Triestino is similar to the language spoken throughout what was once the Venetian Empire you saw earlier on this map. The language was spoken by traders and fishermen all along the eastern coast of the Adriatic and throughout the eastern Mediterranean and with modification in Trieste too. On top of its Italic Venetian base, Triestino contains many words from the Slavic languages, especially Slovenian and Croatian and from the nearby, more mountainous and almost entirely landlocked Friuli to the north and west of the city. There are terms as well in Triestino from German, of course, and even some from English. I have an example that I'll put up on the screen now. <laughs> Pronounced as you've recognized, son of a bitch! <laughs> My Triestino Italian dictionary specifies that son of a bitch is a dialect word that has come into Triestino from English-speaking sailors who, I don't know, hit their, 
there's some with a hammer or I don't know, or, uh, 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 or from inhabitants, uh, inhabitants of the city who have been to America and then returned. The word, the dictionary continues, is an expression of irritation and mild anger rather than an insult casting aspersions on someone's genealogy. To speak Triestino then was and is a way of establishing one's unique identity as a resident of a particular city culturally tied to Italy, the Italy sometimes visible across the waters of the upper Adriatic, but who is at the same time proudly separate from residents of that country. There's another word in the dictionary that you may also find interesting. The word is Italian, derived of course from Italiano, which in Italian means Italian. <laughs> in Triestino, however, a Italian is a recent immigrant to the city from somewhere in southern Italy who may very well speak Triestino himself or herself, but is nonetheless seen, though often ironically and affectionately, as other, that is, Italian, and not really a Triestino. During the 20 years of the fascist regime, attempts were made to eliminate the use of dialects and other non-Italian languages all over Italy. They were especially and cruelly persistent in Trieste, in the case of Slovenian, especially in the schools. Residents of the city and region who spoke Slovenian and considered themselves Slovenian were even forced to Italianize their last names and punished for speaking Slovenian in schools and elsewhere in public. The Giotti family, too, was subject to this forced Italianization of their last names. Instead of, instead of being known as Schönbeck, family members were referred to in documents from the fascist era when Giotti's sons were in fact in the army and died in Russia as Belli, which is a kind of translation of their German surname. Let me turn now to sketch out the role that Italy's dialects played in the development of the national language and the history more generally of Italy. The first poems written in, in, in Italy after the demise of the Latin writing and to some extent Latin speaking Roman Empire were written in local languages, that is dialects. Among the first of these were the love poems composed by what has come to be called the Sicilian school of the period just before Dante, the group of poets who, among other things, invented the sonnet. Dante himself, who lived between 1265 and 1321 and wrote sonnets as well as his comedy, wrote his poetry not in Italian, which in some sense had not been invented yet, but in his native dialect, that of Florence. This same dialect was also employed by his two great successors, Boccaccio and Petrarch. Like the poets of the Sicilian school, Dante did not use the Florentine of the streets, though he could use some rather salty expressions himself at times. Instead, he employed a more refined or illustrious, as they said about the Sicilian's version of that language. Dante famously characterized this means of communication as one that even ordinary women, he called them muliercoli, who were largely uneducated and even less likely to be able to read and write than men, that women of this sort used when talking to one another. Writing about this in Latin, he called this language a locutio vulgaris et quae et muliercoli communicant, a people's language in which even ordinary women communicate. Petrarch used an even more refined language for his poems in the vernacular, though Boccaccio took a somewhat different direction with a greater use of the language of everyday people in his stories. The real breakthrough, though, and what amounted to the invention of Italian took place in the 16th century. With more and more commerce and other kinds of exchanges throughout the peninsula, a common language was needed for political and commercial communication. Since Italy had no political capital the way England had London and France Paris, the language chosen for these purposes was the language of the three great Tuscan writers from 200 years earlier, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. During the 16th century, Machiavelli wrote his political and philosophical works in this language, and a little later, Galileo wrote at least some of his scientific treatises in it too, something relatively easy for these two since they were both Tuscans. This was the moment in Italian history when people speaking a variety of different Italians began to be able to understand one another through print, that is, if they could read, and the majority could not, as part of the process described by Benedict Anderson in his book on imagined community, co communities, some of you have no doubt read. <coughs> During the period of the nationalization that Anderson talks about, that is during the unification of Italy in the years between 1861 and 1871, attempts were made to have all citizens of the New Italy speak a single language, maybe alongside their native language. This was particularly important for the schools, 
and in the army, for example, where officers needed to be able to communicate with their soldiers quickly, and the officers were not necessarily from the same region as their men. Although efforts to establish a national language had some success after unification, it was really only with the advent of television in the 1950s that all Italians came to learn the national language and that Italy was finally unified linguistically. Okay, Janice, more or less? All right, thank you. <laughs> but at this point, another problem arose. The people speaking Italian on television, which in those years had only government channels, were often considered by many who watched them to be proponents of an establishment that they at least distrusted, probably hadn't voted for, and maybe even hated. Among these were these haters or distrusters. Among them were many intellectuals and writers, including writers of poetry. And so, paradoxically, just when Italy had been unified linguistically, there was now a movement by at least some writers away from the national language in favor of a language that was less compromised, less commercialized, less intent, many of them thought, on mystification and domination. They wanted instead a language that was somehow more authentic, more able to speak truth to power when this was needed. Among these dissenters was Pier Paolo Pasolini, whose films many of you know, and whose first books of poetry were written in the language of the Friuli, a politically autonomous region that abuts Trieste and whose language has been, as already mentioned, was, has been an influence on Triestino. Beginning perhaps in the 1970s or maybe earlier, Italian poets, who since Dante's time had been writing in Italian, began to turn to writing in dialect. While there had long been poetry and theater in the various dialects, this new kind of poetry was not grounded in folklore and nostalgia and was not directed exclusively at a local audience. Sometimes it made use, the case of the poetry of Andrea Zanzotto, for example, of the highest levels of culture, science and philosophy in Zanzotto's case, and was aimed at a national and international audience of highly educated readers. This movement toward dialect poetry can be seen as a refusal of the reductive aspects of a hegemonic culture and a return to the local of the sort that we have seen in our country today and that in Italy has given rise to less savory sorts of localization in the form of right-wing Italy first movements. For many such writers, the national language is seen as bookish and oppressive. One critic, Franco Brevini, has even said that the official Italian language when used in literature is just as foreign to the everyday reader today as Latin was to the reader of Dante's Machiavelli's or Galileo's times. Brevini has suggested that when writing dialect poetry, the poet brings to the threatened individual, in his words, an additional sense of identity and of resistance, as well as the support of a culture that is radically different from the dominant culture of the country at the moment. I would now like to say something about Virgilio Giotti, and I hope that you all have or can put your hands on the handout, which I'm going to refer to so you can follow uh, more easily. Say something about Virgilio Giotti. Here's a picture of him. Uh, a poet who wrote almost entirely in uh, Triestino. Giotti's work belongs to the period before the re-evaluation of dialect poetry that began in the 1970s and has become widely read and admired since. Giotti began to publish in 1914. New work by him continued to appear until his death in 1957. No. Uh, so I would like to read now the first poem from the handout. It's called Inverno, Winter. I don't really speak uh, Triestino, but I can read it off the page. Uh, and uh, if there's someone here who knows it better than I do, which may be, I hope they'll uh, look, at, look at this with some indulgence. I'm going to read the Italian. And an English translation is published just beneath each line. The first poem has rhymes, uh, so it'll be easy to follow uh, where we are. Here we go. Inverno. De pulsiteri nelle vetrine, che verdoline le olive za, che zele renge, belle de arcento, e sufi un vento, in diavola, cattivo inverno, ecco te qua. Uh, this word, <laughs> putziteri, is from the Friulano, but is also common in Istria. The word derives from porco, or pig, 
uh, but it's not used in Italy outside of the Northeast. It might be. I was, yes. Yes. Kind of. My best Triestino. <laughs> uh, it might be compared to the term, this term, pulsiteri, used by Italian Americans in the New York area for Italian delicatessens, which they call, some of you know, pork stores. This is maybe the only poem in, in, in the Italian language to feature a herring. Uh, not even Dante, who used a lot of words of all sorts uh, in his comedy, uses it there. Herrings and olives, the north and the south, central Europe, maybe northern Europe, and the Mediterranean. Uh, emblematic, if you like, uh, of uh, Trieste as at once a northern European and a Mediterranean city. Uh, uh, Giotti wrote an entire volume called Colori, Colors, uh, and in this simple poem, the silver of the herrings and the green of the olives are important factors. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read uh, is one of Giotti's best known. It's the one that's featured at the beginning of the Wikipedia article uh, on him. Uh, and it's a frequently anthologized uh, poem. It's a little over 100, year, 100 lines uh, long, and I'm going to read some excerpts of it to you. It's called Iveci che spetta la morte, Old Folks Waiting for Death. I la spetta sentai sulle porte, delle cesette svode di paesi, davanti sui muretti, co fra i labri la pipa. I la spetta sentai nelle corte, de fora delle case, in strada, Sentai su una carrega bassa, con le mani sui zenocci. I fioi che zoga torno, i zoga coi corretti, i, i zoga cora si drio, i ziga, i urla, che noi gene poi più. Passa la gente, passi i cari de corsa con un strepito, pieni, stivai de omini e de muli, che torna dal lavoro, e tra de loro, che sei un per di fie, matte, bacanone, che in mezzo a quei scassoni le ridi e ridi e le gai il rosso del tramonto in fronte. E l'aspetto sentai sulle porte dei bodeghini scuri in zitta vecchia. Nei piccoli caffè sentai da fora, con davanti due soldi di acqua col mistrà. E legge il foglio, ma tutte robe, c'è, che gli interessa poco. Ma come mi, e lo leggi, quando che spetto su una cantonata la mia putella, che tiro fuori il foglio per far qualcosa. Ma che legger, credo di legger, ma go il pensiero invece a tutto altro. A un camminare, una voce, che mi par di sentir, mi fermo. Escolta. Maybe you'd notice the unusual word for boy or young man, which is mulo, plural muli, and a girl is a mula, plural mule. Now the etymology of the term is controversial, but it may come from a word in Latin, mulus, that in English became mule. Uh, uh, that is a cross between a horse and a donkey. Although it's anyone's guess, the idea may be that young men and women, as neither children nor adults, are, as we say, neither fish nor fowl, and thus mules. <laughs> or it may be an affectionate insult, like when we might call someone a silly bastard. But muli and mule is what young people are in Trieste, in Giotti's day and today. In this episodic narrative, the poem I've just read you, the elderly are seen contending with rambunctious children, looking nostalgically at a cartful of young women returning merrily from work and having a drink at a simple cafe. At the conclusion of the poem, the old folks are contrasted with the poet himself, who is depicted as holding, but like them, not reading, a newspaper. The poet, however, unlike the vecchi he has been observing, is uninterested in what is written in the newspaper, not because he is about to leave the world, whose activities it describes, but because he is waiting impatiently for his lover. While mortality is an important theme of the poem, at its conclusion, death is balanced with life, just as resignation is balanced with anticipation and melancholy with joy. The third and last poem by Giotti I'm going to read 
is called Vecchio Motivo, old song, if you like. Come il vin che la vita, che in principio è il che mosto, turbidozzo, che l'osto porta in tola ridendo. Dopo, le sabona, le, dopo la se fa bona, come il bon vin maduro, che nel goto è il che sei scuro, e il brilla contro luce. L'adne diventa un ultimo acido che svampissi, ben par chi che finissi senza veder quei giorni. Altro, non ha cori dir. Like in Verno, this poem rhymes, and it is made up of sev seven syllables, uh, uh, verses, the classic Italian settenario. On one level, it's simple reflections on the similarities between wine and life. Surprisingly, perhaps, the poem is quite a literal translation of a poem written in ancient Greek, written by Alcaeus, who lived between the 7th and 6th centuries BC, before the Christian era and said more or less exactly the same thing. A poem with rhyme and meter, then, that is written in the language of the sometimes illiterate people of Trieste and deliberately harks back to the beginnings of Western literature to express what is perhaps a perennial truth, that is, that life passes. But it also insists that this is a natural process, like that of grape juice maturing into wine and then declining into vinegar. But if this is a sad, though natural, process, wine is something extremely precious, just like life a sentiment this very old song repeats. I want to turn now to a living poet, Claudio Grisancic. The picture of him here, he seems to be in a toy store. I don't know what that's about, but uh, anyway, there he is. Uh, uh, Claudio Grisancic was uh, in some ways a follower of Giotti, whom he knew as a boy and admired. And uh, Krizantrich's poetry is poetry of very simple effects that deals with very simple subjects whose sometimes fundamental importance his verses memorialize. For example, he has written a wonderful poem, one that I don't, I'm not going to read to you today, about making spinach risotto while listening to Mozart on, uh, on the radio. And it's a, it's a very good recipe, too, for the risotto. Uh, the poems I'm going to read are all from his most recent book, uh, which is shown here. Uh, it's called Album. There's another picture of uh, Claudio Grisacic when he was a, a, a little boy and uh, got a bicycle which had uh, training wheels at first. Uh, anyway, there he is, and there is a, a picture of the street uh, where the poems are set, uh, where he lived as a boy. Uh, the street is pretty much abandoned uh, uh, today. Uh, as you'll see in the three poems that conclude the uh, little anthology here, the poems are printed in, the Grisantrich's poems are printed without capital letters or punctuation, and they feature quick changes of subject like jump cuts in the movies that Grisantrich was and is very fond of. In these poems, standard grammar has been displaced by sentence fragments that come at the reader in an ungrammatical jumble. The first poem, Lamante, records what is being said by a group of gossipy women. In Trieste, they're called Babe. And perhaps they're the equivalents of Dante's Mulierculi, who are indignantly describing two other residents of the building where they live. And it, it's fragments, and so the voices come through in kind of a jumble. So you have to have a little uh, patience for these. Called the girlfriend, Lamante. All these people, all these Bobby talking. Venti anni de meno, la gafata de tutto. Finché la sa di moglie e fioi, lui sei lega ciolta, giovane e amante. De un uomo coi sui bori, importante. Po, se venu il crollo, la vecchia, l'infarto, invalido, la lo ha messo su una sedia a rodelle. E co la ga d'andar, pai cazzi sui, la lo sere in ripostiglio contro il muro. Perhaps a kind of cruel poem, and one of the many in the collection describing relationships gone bad. The Babe describing the couple would seem to suggest that the rich man with the much younger mistress got just what he deserved. Life has rules that you defy at your peril. 
Giotti wrote no political poems, perhaps out of deference to the fascist censor, partly because he was concentrating in his poems on other matters that he believed were more important than the contingencies of a cruel history. Grisanchich, however, did feel the need to chronicle this same cruel history. He has a poem, for example, about taking refuge with his mother in the Via San Michele in an air raid shelter during the British and U.S. bombing of his city. And the poem that follows is in some ways a, a political poem, Scarpe, it's called, Shoes. In Germania i nazisti la cercava. Se diceva che visto Hitler, proprio vis-a-vis, la fosse tornada a casa sputando per la strada, in una, per la strada. In una camera, indosso le scarpe, sempre pronte in soffitta, tutti a conoscerla come la tedesca, la mattina del 43, la porta spalancata, il letto ribaltà, e là le scarpe. The poem describes with some very sketchy but sufficient details the last moments of an anti-Nazi German, or more likely Austrian, uh, woman who had apparently taken refuge in Trieste during the Nazi occupation of the city. The poem is thus similar to other poems in the collection about Tito's troops marching through the younger Sanchez's neighborhood, right down that street there, uh, and about the occupying Americans later and their interactions with the mule, the young girls of the city. The poem makes no judgment but limits itself to recording the dismay and fear of the residents of an apartment building as they peer into La Tedesca's now empty room. Empty, that is, except for the shoes she thought she could use in her getaway, but instead have been left behind as a mute testimony of what must have been a violent scene. The last poem I, I'm going to read you, the final brief composition, is a poem articulating Grisanchich's poetics or general poetic strategy. It's called Per Nome, by Nome. Dear le robe col su nome, così anche per le persone che si incontrava sulle scale di casa, fermarsi un pie sul scalin, l'altro più in basso. Posai al passaman parlare anche di niente, giusto di toccarsi con la voce. Though some of the lines in, the poem, in this poem, as Jonathan, I'm sure, picked up, uh, recall a similar situation in Dante's comedy, uh, who writes about how his autobiographical main character pauses when about to take on the dark wood that he must traverse to get to purgatory and paradise in such a way that si il pie fermo sempre era il più basso. Despite this, the poem is a description of the simplest of situations, an encounter in a stairwell with a fellow tenant. Like Seinfeld, if you like, this is a poem that despite the Dante illusion, describes talking about nothing, that is about the matters that make up much of everyday life and insists that just because we don't pay much attention to them, these are not necessarily without importance. The idea of touching people with your voice, using language not to inform, much less control, like those rascals on the TV or who are interviewed in the newspaper, but just to establish contact with another person that is a kind of unpretentious and non-invasive touching. It is difficult to say what will happen to dialect poetry in the future. Will it survive the competition with popular music? Bob Dylan, after all, has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But to return to the grandmother of my 101 student mentioned at the beginning of this talk, as long as we sense that authenticity, whatever we may mean by that, is an important value Communication that attempts to convey feelings and convictions that are not those of, of officialdom, whether in Rome or in Washington, will perhaps always be cherished. And in Italy, that means of communication may well continue to be that of dialect poetry. Here, as a conclusion to my, my remarks this afternoon, is what Grisancic has said in a passage I paraphrase about the matter. Here's what he said. The dignity and worth of dialect in literature lie in its capacity to become an instrument for cultural and civic commitment, where the search for the right word becomes a sophisticated technique for self-control that can transform suffering 
into melancholy, in this way making such suffering easy to bear as well as a suitable topic for preservation and dissemination. Thank you very much. We, huh? We've got time? You think? I could take a few uh, questions, maybe. Hope you found some of what I said provocative or I hope not puzzling. Paul? Charles, what, to what audience are they writing or for what audience? Ah, good, and how, good. And how large is it? Good. Well, they're writing for me, it turns out. Okay. Uh, it, it used to be that dialect poets were writing for the people of the city, mm -hmm. uh, or the people of the dialect region with jokes and references to local people and events and so on. Uh, but now, since the 70s, uh, it's poetry that, Triestino is not hard to understand for someone who knows Italian, for example. Uh, and uh, you can always print it with uh, translations into Italian. Sometimes mm. they do, sometimes they don't. So it, it, they're really writing it for a national and international language, for uh, international audience uh, who are uh, tired of the official language, the, mm -hmm. the fake news of the official language, if you like, or language using, being used to uh, confuse, uh, to mystify, uh, or uh, to uh, control. Uh, and uh, in the anthologies of Italian poetry, all sorts of Italian poetry of the 20th century that have been published over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, there, are, there are many uh, dialect poets with, uh, with uh, Italian uh, mm -hmm. translations at the bottom of the page or interlinearly, as I said. So for everyone, Zanzotto's a terribly difficult poet. In fact, he's too hard for me. I had a lot of trouble with him because of the science and the, philo the philosophy and the psychoanalytic terminology that he uses. So he's not writing for his barber, you know, <laughs> uh, or for the, guy, uh, for the guy down the street. He's using the language of a, of, of a region uh, that he's enriched with, uh, with uh, all aspects of his own personal culture and so on. So, sir, yes, please, Lois. And in Venetian and in uh, Triestino and some of the other languages, se, se. So it means uh, that, it, so that, that. It is, che, se. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. It just okay. Uh, you look a little skeptical like that one on one student. <laughs> oh, Janice, do you know? It's just a, a, a regionalism. Naturally, uh, uh, you know, uh, Italian began to be written down at a certain point, uh, and uh, the, the dialects uh, began to be written down after they had a considerable history uh, behind them. So, uh, first they had, as Janice was saying, first there was an alphabet, <laughs> and then they tried to make the dialects fit into the alphabet as best they could with diacritical marks or an X that we don't have in Italian uh, or, or what have you. Good question, both of them, yes. Good. Um, in the middle of your talk, somewhere you mentioned, um, and I heard the election in the middle of your talk, you mentioned that there are, I think it was, <coughs> a, a certain interest in, in regional languages, dialects, yes. having to do with certain cultural uh, Yes. Yes. See, see, see if the, 
Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, Grisantius is alive yeah, right. today, and there and there are many there are many others as well. But is uh, there a yeah. Let, let, let me let me see if I've understood sort of where you're going here. Uh, fascism ruled Italy from 1923 to 1943, more or less. Uh, and one of the tenets was a, 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 a sort of nationalism. Everybody who lived there was uh, Italian, or uh, should be. And uh, if you wanted to go to a school, as you had done, uh, where the language was Slovenian, you couldn't. The school was closed. Uh, if you wanted to go to a school where they spoke Krico, uh, which is a kind of Greek down in Calabria, uh, those schools were closed too. Um, uh, names were, last names, surnames were forcibly uh, changed. Uh, and it worked to a certain extent. I mean, you could control the schools and you could control what's printed in the newspapers. Uh, uh, but after 1943, everything went back, right? And, uh, uh, and so speaking dialect or, or writing in dialect was, was an expression of a kind of anti-fascism. But then later, when the, fascist, when the fascists were succeeded by the Democristian government, which my friends in Italy said they're all dirtiest fascists too, they just go to church, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, then uh, people objected to that too. It was, they were objecting descending from the whole, from the whole establishment. I remember being in a, in a movie theater in Florence. Uh, there was something I want to see. I don't know what it was. And I took my family, and we went to this, this theater in a working class, in a working class neighborhood. And the newsreel came on, right? And the audience went crazy. They were booing and hissing and yelling at, I don't know, it was the, the, it was the, uh, the, the bishop cutting the, uh, cutting the ribbon on a new building and someone reporting on the economic state of the, of the country and so on. So, so there was a, 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 a feeling of dissent uh, against the government and, and against the language that they used on, on television which, uh, and in the newspapers and in official proclamations and even on instructions as to, are you paying your income taxes these days? I bet you are. Well, you know, those instructions, right? Maybe you have to hire somebody to figure out what it is that they mean. Well, this kind of bureaucratic language uh, permeated a lot of official Italian culture. So there was a, a kind of distrust of that. So paradoxically, television, end of the war, the 50s, Italy finally unified linguistically, if you like. But at the same time, people say, no, I don't want that. You know, I don't want those bastards in Rome to, you know, uh, to tell me how to think uh, or, or, or what you will. Yes, Lois, you get two. So where does the Italian of the libretto set by Verdi and Puccini fit into this story? Yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's a real, you mean the weird Italian of those libretti, because no one ever said that. Uh, no, no one ever said, especially in Verdi's case, no, no, no one ever said what they sing. Uh, it, it's extremely complicated, um, uh, but the idea was that that was a kind of highfalutin language that separated, if I got this right, you probably know better than I do, that separated the, the language of the theater from the language of everyday life. And certain things you couldn't say. Uh, you couldn't say God, for example, and you, so you said, oh, oh spirits, or oh gods. Mm -hmm. Gods uh, was uh, was okay, and especially in Rome, that there were censorship uh, issues of this sort so as well. Part of what I'm asking about is the, the attitude toward it. I mean, it, you know, it, those operas are loved, uh, were loved. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, it, it was the music, obviously, and the story, and the abilities, so uh, and the abilities the of the singers. But it was it was a, it was a phony language, you know. It was it was a folk. There's a story I think about someone <laughs> who decided that she would learn Italian, right? And so uh, she studied the opera libretti, and and then she went to Italy, and no one no one had the slightest idea. Not only could she not you know say I have to use the bathroom or how much is the coffee, but no one could understand what she was what she, what, she, what she was saying. So an artificial language maybe to to, to mark the difference between that kind of theater, you no. Know, especially the opera seria, that kind of theater. And you know, a lot of it happened in Venice where they were speaking Venetian anyway, or, or they were foreigners. So when they went to hear Vivaldi's operas or, or some of the other ones uh, in, uh, uh, in Venice, it was, it was twice foreign. <laughs> it was not Venetian and it was not exactly, uh, is, uh, uh, is Ted here? You want to say, you want to say some more about it? We've got an expert here who,
significant moments of significant words can be very concise, expressible in one, uh, I'm gonna say one note or one, one high note or something like that. So the, the actual linguistic communication is something that happens in connection with foreseeing what the musical, um, what, what the musical communication is going to be, which means that it's not a language that you can easily read as literature on its own, and it's certainly not a language that you can communicate in. It's yeah. all been informed yeah. by the need to adapt itself to the kind of communication that can be done in music. Does that help? T Ted has written on, the, on this very topic. Yes, sir. Well, what I want to know is on what is modern Italian most closely based? I mean, there must have been a dialect somewhere that just sort of took over. It, it, was, the, it was the dialect of the so-called three crowns of Dante, Petrarch, and, and, and Boccaccio. Uh, the decision, you could say, well, they made a decision on artistic uh, or in, in a cultural context rather than a political one. With no, with no political center, something had to be picked. And there were these, th uh, they're great geniuses, right? I mean, they, they're moving, we teach them at the university, all the universities today. Uh, many of my colleagues have chosen to become teachers of Italian because they read Dante and thought, oh my God. So uh, it, it was a kind of compromise, I think, and people just said, what's gonna be Florence? Not Venice, no, not Milan, certainly not Rome. Uh, we're going to have Florence. Florence was not really a contender in the early years mm -hmm. to become uh, the capital of Italy. So it was a kind of finessing of the whole issue. Is that helpful? Is there an authority that decides what is Italian? No. Uh, as they have they, they've they've, they've tried that. No, not, as in not like in France. No, 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 no. no. And uh, people today still speak all kinds of different... It when, when Ted and, and, uh, uh, and we go to Italy, they may say, Oh, what part of Italy are you from? You speak, you know, like, are you from Milan or, or what have you? <laughs> but no, there's, there's never, they, they tried it for a while, the Academia della Crusca uh, tried for a while to have a dictionary and to set rules and so on, but it didn't work very well. I mean, people, yes, Don. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's an article I read in, uh, in one of the journals recently about uh, 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 there has sprung up among the young in some places a return to the dialect but, but that their parents don't speak but their, grandpa, but their grandparents do a return to the dialect mixed in with hip hop and uh, obscenities and all kinds of other things so in some places there's a dialect as a kind of secret language that mom and pa can't understand and grandma and grandpa might, but anyway, they're on our side anyway, so, you know, so, so, so it doesn't matter. There's been a lot of popular music and dialect, too, and there still is. And, of course, the, the major consumers of popular music are, are, are the young. So there is that. Yes, sir. I don't think so, huh? Would you say? Berlusconi's? No. It's the... It's the does Berlusconi's network use a, a special kind of a tell? I don't think so. No, no. no. What it does is lots of nudity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dana. Um, I have a follow-up on a political question. You mentioned that Bill Bill and Bill Russell is really in non-political writing. He's wrote a lot about like, Christian Bale and Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I get. She wants to know: Are there political? Uh, is political poetry being written in in, in Trieste, so, or, or elsewhere? Yeah. So are, are you saying do people sense that they're somehow dissenting by choosing? Yeah, well, you know, I think so. It's it's a way of opting out of, of the establishment language of uh, of the of of the of the, of the dominant culture. Uh, Fabrizio de André, uh, who died recently, well, I guess not so recently, 
uh, was a kind of Bob Dylan uh, in Italy and some of and, 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 and very much a countercultural figure. And as you know, uh, a lot of his songs are, are, are in dialect, the dialect of Genova, the very difficult uh, dialect uh, of, of, of Genova. Yes, Carlos. Uh, they are, uh, there's an interesting, uh, there's something that touches on Italian literature, it's kind of interesting uh, thing that happened. Umberto Saba was homosexual uh, all of his life, uh, and um, uh, his poems, we now know that some of them that are addressed to women, or young women, mule, <laughs> uh, were in fact addressed to, to men. Uh, just before dying in uh, 1957, uh, um, uh, Umberto Saba wrote his only novel, which is called Ernesto. Uh, and he, he gave uh, uh, instructions that the novel should not be published until after he was dead, because he was worried about his image uh, and, 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 and so on. Or, I don't know, just a little bit uh, uh, goosey about uh, his sexual uh, preferences. Anyway, it was published after his death. It's called Ernesto. Uh, and it's all in Italian, except there are scenes between the young boy of the novel uh, and uh, the stevedore that they have a, a, a sexual affair, a homosexual affair, and that's all in Triestino. Hmm. So uh, it's not really Triestino. People say, well, people really say that's this Triestino that's been fixed so that people uh, outside Trieste can, uh, can understand it. So it was used for a very special, uh, almost secret, uh, erotic uh, purpose rather than rather than uh, now now uh, as Ted knows <laughs> Goldoni uh, uses uh, Goldoni wrote in um, in Venetian in uh, in French and in Italian and in one of his, and in, in some of his plays but in one of them in particular I'm thinking of uh, people speak dialect uh, th their servants <laughs> think mm -hmm. and someone said what he say they're all speaking, I think it's in Venetian, isn't it? Do you know the one I have in mind? They're speaking Venetian and they say, what does he say? I can't understand anything he's saying. And so that would be an example of a figure of, a figure of, of, of fun. Yes, sir. Which present day Italian dialect is most different from standard Italian? Ah, th that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. I think Genovese is difficult. I, I was once at an event but where... Different. Well, well. Uh, what about Sicilian? No, Sicilian is, is not. If when you see it printed, it's 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 not so hard. I would say, uh, uh, Genovese is different enough from standard Italian that to make it difficult to understand. So that's why I said difficult, different. Uh, though I was at a, a poetry reading at, or reading at one point, and there was a man from Genova. And I said that, you know, Genovese is one of the most difficult dialects. <laughs> he got all angry. He said, well, it's not a difficult dialect. It's not for me. <laughs> so, remember that? <laughs> he was the mayor, too, wasn't he, or something? I, yeah. Well, I don't go back to Genova anymore. <laughs> I, by the we, way, I'm standing we, yeah, because I yeah. think we've reached the end of our time. Yeah, okay. uh, this has been a fascinating window into well, a very thank different you. Thank place. You. Thank you I'm much. sure Charles will be around afterwards. I will. Uh, in case you have additional questions. To ask. Uh, I've mentioned just two other things. One is that I'm instructed to tell you to put your name badges on the table as you leave. Outside we recycle those and we hope you will come back for another one of our, our lectures. Secondly, we always have a business meeting at the end of these lectures. I have no business. If anybody has business, <laughs> remain silent and <laughs> we will finish off but coming up and, and certainly thanking Charles for it's a pleasure. Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.